Um, okay. <coughs> so with the focus today on doing um, writing reports using R, um, and I'm going to just show you this at the beginning, but we'll come back to it. So there's actually a um, website out here called RPubs that as you create documents, you can post them out here. Now this is just, this is a public forum. Anybody and everybody can post things out here. And you can see things that were recently published and people post things here all the time. Matter of fact, a lot of instructors now have gone to where when they're teaching our classes, their students submit their homework on this website. They just go to the website and download stuff. So I have an account on here. So I'm going to get signed in because there's a, some examples I'm going to show you guys. <coughs> All right. Um, and this was in some of the links that I sent yesterday. So we're going to do a couple of these. Um, and this is one of the ones that we're going to create. So one of the easiest ways to make a document to start with is to do it, and it'll, it'll save out as HTML, which is hypertext markup language. But it's basically a web page. So if you've ever looked at that. And so the awesome thing about this is you can use R to make web pages, and you don't have to learn HTML. <laughs> so anybody here ever tried to make their own web page? A couple? So, of course, there's a lot of tools now out there where you can sort of drag and drop things and you don't actually have to know HTML like you used to. <laughs> um, but you guys are going to learn Markdown. So HTML stands for Hypertext Markdown Language. There's another version just called Markdown that if you Google Markdown, um, it's like a lightweight version of HTML. And then from inside R, we're going to learn the R version or flavor of Markdown. It's, it's basically the full Markdown, but it has a few little things that are help it tie in better with sort of understanding R code and that kind of thing. So when you do this, you get like a title and your name and you can put in the date and some of that can be auto-generated. You can create all kinds of templates for the front end. And then you just start typing. I mean, you, you put in your text, you put in, um, you can have hyperlinks, you can th make things that are bold, you can have italics. Um, right now I've got it where like we learned that summary command. So there's a data set that's built into R called cars, which is basically, um, it has speed and distance, which is the speed that the car is going and then how long or how far um, the stopping distance is when the car, I guess, applies the brakes. There's a bigger description. Anyway, so there's two variables in that data set. And if we summarize them, you get some basic stats. So what you're seeing in the document is the, c the command and then the output. Now I'm going to show you guys some things to clean that up. And you have options to either show or not show the code under the hood. For teaching purposes, it's really helpful to show it, but if you're writing a document for publication, you're going to hide all that. But the cool thing about it is, if I was to go and get your document and see the raw code, I could figure out everything you did, where the data set came from, all the data transformations, all the fixing, all the cleaning, the modeling, etc. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about tables, but for right now, it's easy to just get sort of raw R output and it'll show in the um, final document. In plots, it's fantastic. So anything that you can generate using R graphics, it's easy to embed those like on the fly. So that one's a really simple one. I'm going to have you guys do that one probably first. I'm also going to show you guys how to make a simple like this is not PowerPoint. <laughs> it's actually I think this one's called IO slides. There's like three different ways to make slides using R. Um, but this is kind of especially if you're wanting to do something where you know you're going to have to update this again, and you want to all you want to do is update your data or update your code, and then you just click a button and all your slides update. So it's you know it has like a header, and you can put in text or bullets. Um, Again, this is similar, where we've got the R code and then the output. Um, here's an example for a plot. 
this was one I added last night, and I'll show you guys a little bit more about this, where I went in and actually ran a linear regression of the stopping distance versus the speed of the car, and then here's the output from that regression along with the model fit statistics, and then a plot of that. Yes, ma'am. And I can't tell you how many, especially the math stack conferences I go to, that you'll see a ton of these. Yeah. Assuming you have inter <laughs> internet access. So you could still bring it, but then again, they, uh, they wouldn't necessarily have to have a specialized presentation software. All you need is a browser. So, Because you, you can read HTML and web pages locally. It doesn't have to come over the internet. Um, and then let's see. Oh, and then I had a picture of what that fitted model looks like. So I've actually got the fitted line, the plots, and like a non-parametric smooth line through there. And I'll show you guys that. And then this is another one. We played around with this a little bit, I think, in, um, I can't remember if it was the first session or the second session. Anyway, but this is a way to create sort of panel plots where you go through and show a plot by some third variable gender, whatever. In this case, this is another cars type data set that looks at miles per gallon against the weight of the car. And then um, I had it paneled over the number of cylinders that are in each car. This is another one called, M excuse me, MT cars is a um, data set built in from the Motor Trends. I think it was published in 1977. So when you look at this data, these cars are incredibly heavy and huge. These are land yacht cars. All right, so that's another one. Oops, went the wrong way. Um, and then the last one I'm going to show you guys is, we'll see how far we get. <laughs> but this is something that, um, like, I've been working a lot with Andy and Vicky's team talking about what we can do besides just the common data elements that we've been working on, but it's also the whole idea that everybody, in this case, the CESD, which is a depression measurement instrument questionnaire, um, but everybody who does the CESD, if everybody captures that information in the same way, that that instrument is coded the same across every project that we do here, then, you know, the analysis and the summary and the scoring code and all of that could be shared. And that could easily be done whether you're in SAS or SPSS, and in this case in R. And I would like to take that to a step further, which is to say that when you get done, if you have used the CESD in your study, we could run this report on your data and you would get this report back on your data. So it would give you all of the psychometrics, the, the reliability, it would tell you how much missing data there is, were there any scoring problems, which subjects are missing data, which items are missing data, all these kind of things. And so my long-term goal is to develop these into templates that we then have available for different instruments or sort of standard data collection forms. Um, so, and I am really open to feedback on this. So this was my first cut, um, and I wanted to also make sure that I could do this. <laughs> um, and so one of the things you'll notice with this one, um, and some of this is just text, obviously, that I typed, but I've got references in here. So the CESD was created in 1977 by um, Lori Radloff, and that was published in 1977. So that citation, the text, Radloff 1977, that's in parentheses, that was written by R code. It's actually calling the citation on the fly. And I've put in the DOI, so you guys will see this in a minute. I put in the DOI, the document, was it document object identifier? Um, and so it's going out to the web. And I actually think it's talking to Crossref. Anybody in here ever looked at Crossref? So it's going and talking and actually doing a pull from whatever their library repository is finding out that that DOI is this reference, puts in the citation here, and then at the very end, down here on the bottom, here's the reference. It did all of that on the fly, and it's going to build a .bib file also on the fly. So when you finish, you'll have a complete reference list, all the citations, and so forth. So anyway, um, 
I've got a couple of other things here, and I'll talk more about this when we get in there. Um, I've got a few tables. Tables, <laughs> it doesn't matter what software you are in, are a huge pain in the hiney. So um, ours no exception. It's getting better. There's more development going on here. So the tables that I show you here, are they will work. They may not be the most pretty things um, on the earth. But I've got some stuff here. And this actually ends up looking a little bit better. So we're going to learn how to do this out to HTML, which is kind of cool. But at another level, you're like, yeah, but I don't write in HTML. I'm going to show you guys how to take the same report and with literally one click of the mouse, you'll export the entire thing to Word. That was, you should have seen the happy dances I was doing in my office about a year and a half ago when they finally got exporting to Word working. And it's so much better now than it was even when it first debuted. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. So basically the code book that's, um, so for those of you using REDCap, when you export from REDCap to SPSS, but even in SPSS or QDS, you have a code book, which has the variable name, the label, and then all of the codes. So um, I'm going to, and actually the data set we're pulling here is actually coming from, I'm actually reading SPSS and then generating this file. Now it's doing some conversion stuff under the hood, but we're starting from SPSS, which is pretty cool. Anyway, so, um, and I was telling Andy the other day, in theory, <laughs> all the technology exists for this to actually happen live against a REDCap database using the API, which is the Applied Programming Interface. So I could actually skip this, this step entirely. Instead of reading the SPSS file, I could actually go back and be pulling it from REDCap. I know the technology exists. The way Emory is supporting REDCap currently, um, they have not opened the API because I think they're worried about server load balancing and stuff. It's kind of like, it, I, has anybody out here ever tried to pull data from Twitter? <laughs> Probably not. You guys aren't as much of a geek as I am. Um, but you can actually go and use the Twitter API and do like text mining, data mining against um, um, feeds from Twitter. And there's a few people here that I know have looked at, like Melissa Pinto I know has looked at some stuff relative to being able to pull data from, let's say, you know, teen sites and things like that to look at their social media commentary relative to, let's say, a mental health um, conversation. So th there's legitimate reasons to use it. But anyway, um, you could actually do stuff like that on the fly. But sometimes people do that, and as soon as you open it up, um, you're sending tons and tons of requests to the server. And if the server's, if the infrastructure's not set up, then um, basically it can cause the server to, like, shut off. <laughs> so um, the guys over in OIT are willing to help or work with me to test some of this functionality, but I don't think it's going to be in production anytime soon. So, um, which is fine. I don't have a legitimate reason to really make it production other than it would be cool to do. <laughs> so um, so there's a few things in here, and I'll, uh, we'll, we'll run through these, some summary statistics. And then um, I've also found this little package in R called the Likert package, um, which is really handy for a lot of the kinds of tools and surveys that we use, um, where you can go through and at a glance look at item level summaries graphically which is really handy and takes you past just sort of the bar graph type stuff that we do in SPSS and gives you some information on the number of respondents that are scoring, you know, in this case, this is a, the CESD is a four, um, was it, four level response. So it's like zero to three. It's like not at all to all the time. Let's see, it's, yeah, rarely up to most or all of the time. Um, and then there's different ways to do this so that it's centered about that midpoint or you can plot it without the centering. Um, it also has some cool little things where you can go through and split things by another variable. In this case, I was looking at it by race, but you could look at it by gender. You could look at it by some other clinical measure. Um, it has some neat things where instead of doing bar graphs, you could do density plots. 
and then it has a heat map. So I'm going to show you guys the code for this. Um, the other thing I've been working really hard on is trying to improve our ability to really do good psychometric analysis of a lot of the tools that we use. And most of these are fairly well validated. So it's not like I'm trying to revalidate <laughs> the CESD. But we often work in populations where, I don't know, maybe the original tool wasn't completely validated in this particular population. So this is always handy to have. And R has some fantastic um, psychometric tools. Um, there's a package in particular that I use called the Psych Package that's done by these guys that um, there's a website out there called the Personality Project that if you want to learn anything about psychometrics they have some really really good information out there. Um, so this is just an example of going through and looking at summary statistics by item and then the references. So these are just um, you know, a couple of the examples that I wanted to show you guys today. And like I said, one of my goals is to begin putting different templates out there. And as I get templates developed, I may, any of you that want to help me test them out, I'll send them to you and go, let's test it out with your data set. I mean, uh, I know Sheila left, but she's my guinea pig this semester for what she's trying to do. So we're actually looking at this manuscript she's writing and getting the initial analyses done in SPSS, but then we're sort of doing it also in R. So it's helping her learn R, but then it's also getting me a chance to think through what's the best way to template some of this out with someone who's trying to write a manuscript. So in a way we're teaching each other this semester. <laughs> so okay any questions? All right so this is on my RPUBS website and I think I did send this out there so um, hold on I'm going to write it. So go ahead and open um, our studio. All right, so give me just one sec. So the files that I had out there on Dropbox, um, we're going to, the first one, we're, well, actually, i tell you what, we're not even going to open those because I know not everybody did. All right, so when you're in RStudio, up here under File, and we did a little bit of this last time, but so... So far, the main thing I've kind of shown you guys how to do in the first couple of workshops was really writing the scripts, right? Writing R commands and executing them, either making a plot or creating a variable or changing a variable. Click on the one that says R Markdown. And it's going to ask you, what do you want to make? <laughs> For right now, we're going to look at documents. So give it a title. My first report. Um, there are some options in here. So for right now, we're going to do HTML for a couple of reasons. It's pretty straightforward. It's usually the least buggy. <laughs> Although for the most part, uh, most of the bugs have been sorted out. For the, I would say the majority of you who have installed R in R Studio, the HTML and the Word options will work right out of the box. If you're interested in publishing or writing straight to PDF, you have to install these other things. So notice it says PDF output requires tech, MCTEC on Windows, MacTechs on OS, or Tech Live on Linux. So you actually have to install a Linux engine, uh, not Linux, I'm sorry, a LaTeX engine on your computer for that to work. Now, unless you just really want to learn LaTeX, <laughs> I would say just skip that step. <laughs> knit to Word, and then from inside Word, just go save as PDF. <laughs> I've had better luck with that anyway, simply because nine times out of ten, if this doesn't work, it's usually because I have a LaTeX error, and then I have to open LaTeX, and I, if you think R is hard, <laughs> so just ignore the middle option for now. Um, so we're going to do HTML, um, but while I'm here, I'll just show you some other things. So there's presentations. The one example that I showed you guys was this IO slides. There's also another variant out there called Slidey. And then Beamer is like a LaTeX thing, so we'll skip that one. I'm not going to talk about Shiny. I'm not even sure I fully understand Shiny. Lisa and I tried to learn Shiny <laughs> um, on the fly last summer, and I, I was like you. At the end, I would... 
I just sat back and listened. Figure I'll go home and download the code and figure it out later. <laughs> so we're not going to do shiny. Um, this is something else, and what you guys see here is probably going to be different than what I see. But these templates, this is a very hot area of development. Um, so I think in your version, you probably could see this package vignette and Tufty handout. How many of you guys in here have ever looked at or heard or seen anything by Edward Tufty? So like I meant to bring the books in this morning, but you know, how to visualize graphics and things like that. He's, he's one of these guys about these are good graphics. These are bad graphics. You know, it's that kind of thing. Anyway, he has a unique style and a lot of people like to emulate his style. So they've actually created, these are like style sheets that you can use and then you could write a report that looks like it was done by Edward Tufty. Um, but there's another package and I'm not going to have you guys install it today, but if you're just bored <laughs> want to play, there's a package out here called Articles. And let me make sure I spell this right. It's R-T-I-C-L-E-S. R-T-I-C-L-E-S. Um, and you, when you install that package, you get all of these templates. One of which, and I haven't tested this out, is an Elsevier journal article title. So journals are getting on board and basically helping people create templates for submitting to their journal because that connects the pipeline of the data source plus the analysis all the way through to publishing. The Journal of Statistical Software has bought into this in a big way. The R Journal has as well. Um, and there's a couple of others that just popped up that I haven't even looked at. There's one here called CTEX, another one called the Association for Computing Machinery. So I, I, I've never looked at anything by them. Um, but these are really kind of cool. And if you use these templates, when you make the document, it looks just like it looks when it's published. It's actually pretty cool. Anyway, all right, so let's go back. We'll do my first report document um, in HTML format. So click OK, and it should generate. So I'm going to give everybody just a minute to do that if you've got it up and running. Yes, did it work? it to create this R markdown file, it may say you need some more packages and stuff. Let me say that again. All right, so the very first time you do a new R markdown file, if you've never run it before, R Studio may prompt you that you need to install some additional packages. Um, and just let it do its thing. It might take a minute. So I'll give you guys a minute to do that. Um, and while those are loading, I'll explain a few things about the front end because this is going to look a look a little weird the first time you see it so I mentioned this is using a format called markdown and up under the help menu um, there are a bunch of different cheat sheets do you guys have this option just curious for those of you that have just installed our studio under help if you click cheat sheets do you guys even y'all see that some do, some don't. I noticed this when I was at the CDC. I, I may be a version ahead of you. So if you don't see the cheat sheets, don't worry about that for right now. I'll show you how to find those in a sec. Hey. Um, do you have this one, the one that says Markdown Quick Reference? OK. So this will open, in, I think, in the Help window. And again, I apologize because I can't. Um, zoom that window but actually while we're here I'll tell you what here's my tools give me one sec I'm actually gonna make my um, my text a little bit bigger I can make it bigger for the um, the other windows but I can't for the help window unfortunately if somebody ever figures that out let me know I make this just one more bigger okay <clears throat> so inside that, and I'll, let me show it one more time. So that was under help markdown quick reference. We'll bring up this help window. 
And you'll notice there's some things here that say these are quick, easy ways to mark instead of mark up. So you can imagine like grading a paper, you know, and you're like putting comments. They call that marking up a paper. So this is marked down. It's the same idea. Um, so if I have a word, like the word italic, if I put an asterisk on either side of it, it tells it when I render that document, make this word italicized. You can also use it by doing little underscores. If you do two of those on either side, instead of making it italic, it makes it bold. So that's the kind of thing. Um, if you use pound signs, the number of pound signs make different levels of headers. So this is a little like playing, uh, how many of you guys have ever played with the different format styles of Microsoft Word? So you can go in and you, could, you can make all your headers level one look a certain way, headers level two look a certain way. So this is just marking that piece of text, everything out that after that will be a header at a certain level. Um, you can make unordered and ordered lists. Um, line breaks are pretty much what you think. You just put a return and keep going. Um, putting in a link to a website is incredibly easy. Um, won't worry too much about images. Most of that sort of take care of themselves from the R code. You can actually put in quotes. I'm going to show you guys how to do the R code pieces here in a minute and in inline code. Um, you can actually put in LaTeX math. I'm not going to teach you guys that. You can put in horizontal rules. Tables are pretty um, simple in terms of the actual formatting, but they're kind of a pain to make. So I'm going to show you guys some workarounds for that. Um, reference styles and stuff, I won't, I won't get into all of that. And there's a website out here, by the way. If you Google just mark down without the R, it will almost always list Daring Fireball. <laughs> you got to love computer programmers, right? Um, by this guy, John Gruber. And this is, trust me, anything and everything you ever possibly wanted to know about Markdown. So nine times out of 10, if you Google a question about using Markdown, it's going to take you here. This is kind of like the original Bible for Markdown. Um, but there's lots of good help websites out there. The other thing I'm going to show you guys, and I'm just, while I'm here, might as well show you um, his website. Underneath our studio, and this is, this is one of the things the developers at our studio have done. So when I first started trying to teach myself this about a year and a half, two years ago, you could you could write all of the text in the code inside our studio, but you really couldn't compile it. You, you had to still do like command line stuff to get it to compile. And it was a mixture of like this package knitter that I'm going to show you in a minute. Um, and then it was also using something else out there as another tool called Pandoc, which was like a, this universal document converter. You could convert from LaTeX to HTML to Microsoft Word to... I don't know, lots of different formats. You, it would translate, basically, between all these different formats. Um, it turns out now, the beauty of our studio is that's all built in. So you don't have to learn Pandoc. <laughs> you don't have to learn all this document conversion stuff. It's kind of built in. Um, <clears throat> so I'm not going to show you that. But the package knitter, which is, let's see, can I make that any bigger? There you go. K-N-I-T-R. So the originator of, let's see, this started in a world called literate programming, and I'm not going to give you guys a huge um, history, but it was by this guy, Donald Knuth, um, and he's like the father of this effort. Um, and when they first started doing this, he said, what you really want to do is you want to weave the code and the document together seamlessly. So you'll see different variations on this idea of weaving <laughs> or some other fabric <laughs> generation. So that sort of analogy is out there. And the first one that was um, on the market that some people still use was a package or a format called Sweeve. And by the way, for those of you that maybe are more SAS oriented, there actually is a SAS Sweeve. I've never tried it. Have, Lisa, have you ever tried it? Um, 
So, and I haven't tested it because I've learned this, and what's the point, right, other than just historical information. Um, so one of the things you'll see here in a minute in R is that you may see a reference to Sweeve. We're not going to use Sweeve, but I just want you to be aware that this that's where this word comes from. So, but instead, the one we're going to use is knitter. Um, and, and in reality, nine times out of ten, when you're running um, R to do this document generation, this is what you'll be using. So I encourage you to kind of glance at this. It gets a little programmy looking <laughs> so don't get overwhelmed um, but UEG is the um, author of this and um, this piece here so the second link that comes up is the one that says chunk options and I am going to show you guys a few things here so this is a great link to remember simply because um, when we start embedding our code remember how I said you could when you make your document you can either have it where it shows you the actual code in the final document or it hides it that's what's called a chunk option. So it actually, they'll, you'll see here in a minute that when we put in little bits of R code, we can either say, show this or hide it. Um, and there are, there's tons more options. There's all kinds of stuff about formatting figures and whether you want to print out warnings to the screen or other error messages and stuff. Um, but a lot of the information on how to do that is on this website. So anyway, I just wanted you guys to be aware of these. 